Imagine starting your day with a simple act of kindness, stepping in for a coworker and expecting nothing more than the usual day's work, only for it to be your last. This isn't just a story. It's the reality that befell Robert Lehman, a devoted family man whose life was abruptly ended in what appeared to be a day like any other. On August 17, 2014, a 38-year-old man named Robert Lehman was asked to cover a shift for a co-worker at his job, something not unusual for Robert. Due to his strong work ethic, and willingness to take on extra responsibilities. He worked at the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway train yard in Teachapi, California, which was a 45-minute drive from his home in Silver Lake's Hellendale, Kern County, where he lived with his wife, Sabrina Lehman, and their two children. Before leaving for work, Robert assured his family that he would return home after his shift, but sadly, he never did. That morning, Sabrina had spoken to Robert, who mentioned he was busy with work and had to quickly grab a tuna melt for lunch on the go. Later in the day, around 5 p.m., when Sabrina visited her mother, she sent Robert a text message, but did not receive a response. Initially not alarmed due to his busy schedule, Sabrina expected Robert home by 8 p.m. However, as time passed without his arrival, she grew increasingly worried. Despite her attempts to contact him through text and calls, she received no response, leaving her anxiously awaiting any news of his whereabouts. Later, two of Robert's colleagues arrived at Sabrina's house with sad news. Robert had been injured at work. Upon hearing this news, Sabrina was under the impression that it was a workplace accident. But police investigations later revealed the grim truth. Robert had been intentionally killed when questioned by the authorities about possible motives or suspects, Sabrina and those close to Robert insisted they were unaware of anyone who may have wanted to harm him. Originating from the tragedy, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway offered a $100,000 reward for any information leading to the apprehension and conviction of Robert's murderer. His body was found in one of the railway yard buildings around 6.46 p.m. After being last seen by colleagues at 5 p.m., Robert had suffered two gunshot wounds, one passing through his face and neck, and another upward into his chest. Law enforcement was able to obtain surveillance footage from a security camera showing a mysterious figure at the railway yard, dressed in bulky clothing and limping noticeably. Expanding their investigation, the police obtained additional footage from a nearby gas station camera depicting a figure similar to the one observed in the railway yard footage. This person was riding a motorcycle, and the timing coincided with when the murder was believed to have occurred. Various angles were considered, with the possibility of a robbery within the yard, but investigators leaned towards the theory of a specific targeting against Robert. As authorities delved into potential motives, Sabrina took to social media to express her profound grief and admiration for Robert. As police went deeper into Robert's life seeking potential motives, they received a call from Jason Bertine, who, along with his wife Kelly, were close friends of Sabrina and Robert. Investigations unveiled a more tangled relationship between them, discovering they were not just friends but participated in a swinger group where couples engaged in sexual activities with others, and the Lamont were involved. Jason's call to the police was not connected to their lifestyle, but rather expressed concerns about a man named Jonathan Hearn, with whom they urged authorities to speak. This revelation introduced a new layer of complexity to the investigation, revealing that Sabrina was having an extramarital affair with the 24-year-old firefighter Jonathan Hearn, despite Jason's warnings to stop the affair. Related to watching Jonathan, go to Sabrina's home in the blink of an eye after Robert's kill bore a noteworthy bouquet of blossoms particularly famous as Sabrina's favorites eminently. Jonathan sent Jason an arrangement of content messages taking after Robert's passing, which struck Jason was unconventional and incited him to contact the specialist. These messages from Jonathan showed up to be centered around looking for pardoning for his seen wrongdoing. Kelly, too, uncovered that Sabrina shared with her a letter she gotten from Jonathan lauding Robert's character 
and communicating regret for his activities in spite of the non-attendance of any captures in association with Robert's passing. Sabrina showed up to be discernibly substance, almost a letter inciting Kelly's unease with respect to the circumstance. Kelly described Sabrina's response saying, isn't this sweet tune in to this tune into how sweet Jonathan is? Criminologists harbored doubts with respect to Jonathan. Sabrina was indirectly involved in Robert's death through a long-term affair she had with a man named Jonathan. During the investigation, the detectives suspected Sabrina's involvement but did not disclose their knowledge of the affair to her. Instead, they subtly probed into Sabrina's marriage using Robert's phone, which contained explicit images of various women, including Sabrina herself. When questioned about possible infidelity or an open marriage arrangement, Sabrina adamantly denied any such arrangement. She asserted that she and Robert had a strong relationship. However, Sabrina's denial only fueled the detective's suspicions. They wondered why she would lie if they were engaged in a consensual open relationship. This led to doubts about Sabrina's honesty and what else she might be hiding. Over a three-month investigation, evidence confirmed Sabrina's affair with Jonathan, spanning nearly two years. Detectives utilized wiretaps and strategic planning to uncover the affair. They provided Sabrina with false details about their investigation to see if she would share this information with Jonathan. Sabrina's subsequent sharing of the fabricated details validated the detective's suspicions. Recordings of Sabrina's calls with the detective revealed a troubling pattern. After conversations with law enforcement, she promptly contacted Jonathan and divulged the details of their discussions. Their conversations often revolved around their love for each other, admissions of their wrongdoings, and pleas for divine forgiveness. As the investigation unfolded, law enforcement officers meticulously gathered information through phone recordings, surveillance footage, and tips. The authorities presented Sabrina with a clearer image of a man captured in surveillance footage, linking him to Robert. Although Sabrina provided names of men named JN, she notably omitted any mention of Jonathan. However, others familiar with Jonathan recognized him in the image and alerted the police. Both Jonathan and Sabrina were arrested and questioned in relation to Robert's murder. Sabrina was released due to lack of evidence, while Jonathan was charged with first-degree murder. Sabrina was informed that she would testify against Jonathan, but this scenario did not happen. Unbeknownst to Sabrina, Jonathan decided to cooperate with the authorities. In exchange for his cooperation, and to avoid a life sentence without parole, Jonathan entered a guilty plea for manslaughter and was sentenced to 25 years and four months in prison. Jonathan admitted to voluntary manslaughter, attempted murder, poisoning, and accessory to murder. Sabrina, however, was charged with first-degree murder, but pleaded not guilty. During her trial, the prosecution argued that Sabrina actively participated in the planning and execution of the murder. Prosecutor Eric Smith presented substantial evidence, including wiretapped phone calls, text messages, and deceitful behavior towards law enforcement, implicating Sabrina in the crime. The court heard details of extensive communication between Sabrina and Jonathan on the day of Robert's murder, with Jonathan placing numerous calls to her. The prosecution highlighted Sabrina's role in providing information about Robert's whereabouts and work schedule on the day of the incident. They argued that Sabrina's motive for the murder was her desire for a new life with Jonathan, claiming she stood to gain financially from Robert's death. Jonathan emerged as the key witness for the prosecution, providing crucial testimony about the planning and execution of Robert's murder. He detailed how he and Sabrina decided to eliminate Robert to be together. Jonathan emphasized their shared commitment to their faith and love for God, stating they planned the murder to pave the way for their relationship to flourish. Ultimately, Sabrina was accused of being equally culpable in orchestrating her husband's murder. Jonathan discussed their plan with Sabrina over the phone before heading to the train yard to carry out their mission. 
During his testimony, he explained how they carefully went over the layout of the railway complex and came up with strategies to avoid getting caught. Sabrina, knowing Robert's potentially confrontational nature, warned Jonathan to be cautious, emphasizing that Robert was not the type to give up easily. Jonathan told the court that he rode his motorcycle to the train yard, making sure to remove the license plate. He also brought a backpack with a change of clothes and a .45 caliber handgun that had a makeshift silencer made from a maglite flashlight barrel and engine freeze plugs. Upon arriving at the Burlington Northern Santa Fe train yard, where Robert worked, Jonathan spotted him in a garage and positioned himself between nearby buildings, contemplating his next moves. After saying a prayer, Jonathan entered into the garage, where he engaged in a brief conversation with Robert before taking advantage of a moment when Robert turned away to stock a refrigerator. Jonathan then drew his handgun, approached Robert, and fatally shot him. He justified his actions by claiming that Robert's elimination was necessary for him and Sabrina to progress in their plan and relationship. Following the initial gunshot, Jonathan proceeded to the office and pilfered some items, later explaining to the court that he and Sabrina believed it would be advantageous for the incident to appear as a robbery. Returning to where Robert lay, Jonathan fired a second shot as a precautionary measure to ensure Robert's demise. He recounted notifying Sabrina of the deed, and they both agreed to refrain from contacting each other for a period to evade suspicion. Jonathan expressed experiencing a sense of relief after the killing. The court heard that just days after Robert's murder, Sabrina sent multiple text messages to Jonathan without questioning who could have killed her husband. Prosecutors argued that this lack of inquiry was due to Sabrina already having the answer and instead constantly expressing her love for Jonathan. Jonathan testified that the day Robert was killed was not the first attempt on his life. Months prior to the murder, Jonathan stated that they had plotted to poison Robert by ordering arsenic online and mixing it into banana pudding, testing it first on a neighbor's dog. Jonathan then gave a portion of the poison pudding to Sabrina with the plan for her to pass it to Robert to take to work for lunch. However, Sabrina later instructed Robert to discard the pudding due to fear of being caught, claiming the bananas had spoiled. The prosecution urged the jury to consider not only Jonathan's testimony, but also Sabrina's conversations on tapped calls and thousands of text messages when determining her guilt. In contrast, the defense argued that the only evidence against Sabrina was Jonathan's unreliable testimony. They portrayed him as a cold and calculated killer who had received a lighter sentence through a plea deal. The defense characterized the prosecution's reliance on Jonathan as striking a pact with the devil. During her trial, Sabrina took the stand and confessed to having an affair with Jonathan, but maintained that she was unaware of his plan to kill her husband. The jury learned that Sabrina provided Jonathan with directions to Robert's workplace and details of his work hours on the day of the shooting using a disposable phone to communicate with him. Sabrina claimed she shared her husband's work schedule with Jonathan solely because she desired to meet him. Sabrina testified that she was content in her marriage to Robert, although their relationship dynamics shifted in 2008 when they began exploring a swinger's lifestyle which altered the sanctity of their bond. She affirmed her love for Robert, but disclosed that the introduction of this lifestyle led to increased alcohol consumption, excessive partying, and sexual activities, causing strain in their relationship. Sabrina met Jonathan at a challenging point in her marriage while working at Costco distributing samples, where initially their interaction was just a friendship. Jonathan eventually asked for her number, and she started developing feelings for him, as he was intelligent and made her feel special in a way she hadn't experienced before. Sabrina described the affair as a kind of second life, where they made plans for shared dreams while still expressing love for her husband, Robert. Questioned by her lawyer about why she initially lied to the police regarding any involvement with someone else, 
Sabrina admitted it was due to embarrassment not wanting her personal life to become public. The lawyer highlighted recorded calls and text messages, arguing that there was no evidence indicating Sabrina's knowledge of Jonathan's plan to kill Robert. The court heard emotional pleas from Sabrina's two children, begging not to be separated from their mother. After deliberating for less than six hours, the jury rendered their verdict, finding Sabrina guilty of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, soliciting murder, and being an accessory after the fact. However, she was acquitted of charges related to attempted murder and poisoning. Sabrina Lyman's sentence of 25 years to life, plus an additional 16 months, despite her family's outcry over the injustice, marks a poignant end to a case filled with deceit, love, and betrayal. Jonathan Hearn's confession and a jury's decision built on a complex mix of evidence highlight the unforeseen consequences of our choices. This tale forces us to ponder the depths of human relationships. What are your thoughts on this story? Drop your insights in the comments below. Thanks for watching Crime Tales TV. For more on the darker sides of humanity and the quest for justice, don't forget to subscribe.